thank all of you for coming today. Thanks to Bob Lindmeyer for joining us today. I was teasing him when he came in that it must be strange to go through life where everybody knows who he is, and he doesn't know who any of the rest <laughs> of the are, but everybody knows Bob, because, yeah, senior chief, what is this? Senior chief meteorologist. How yeah. long have you been at WKOW? 42 years. Pretty impressive, huh? Yeah. Yes. So um, many decades of watching weather phenomenon, I'm sure, has left Bob with um, a lot of observations, but also a lot of scientific background to back up those observations, because that's what meteorologists do, right? They put, put the science behind what they're seeing. And um, Bob has, to the best of my understanding, really put a lot of personal effort into trying ed to educate the public about what he is seeing and what other people in his position are seeing and trying to help us understand the impacts that we all have yes. on climate and um, some things we can do to try and make this, uh, this curve change a little bit. So I'm sure that we'll all learn from listening this afternoon and that Bob will probably be happy to answer questions when he's done. I certainly will be. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you. And good afternoon to you all. Good afternoon. Yeah. So, um, yeah, a little bit of background. I'm from Minnesota originally, came to UW-Madison to get my degree back in 77, graduated my Bachelor of Science degree in Meteorology in 79, uh, started with uh, at the local station here, WKOW-TV, in 1980, January, and I've been there here ever since. So if you do the math, that is about 42 years. I've been, uh, been very fortunate to have uh, spent my whole career at one station, usually you jump around different stations, but I didn't have to do that. been in uh, Oregon now for about uh, 14 years. So live, what attracted us is the golf course, Bergamot, because my wife and I are avid golfers. But uh, we found out all the many other benefits that we have here in Oregon as well. We, we love living here. Um, and uh, plan to retire here as well. So yeah, um, as a broadcast meteorologist, I'm focused on the short term, figuring out what's going to happen over the next week or so, or at most two weeks. But I've also been part of the scientific community that includes climate scientists. And they are the ones that focus on the long term. Uh, going out years, decades, even centuries is what is the area they um, concentrate on. So I've been keeping track of the research and what they've been saying over the years. And what I found was they were becoming very, very alarmed. This is going back 10, 20 years at least uh, about what their, uh, what their findings were. But I was seeing a disconnect because I was seeing the same amount of alarm with the general public. So I decided to use my position as a broadcast meteorologist um, to educate people about what's really going on. Because there's a lot of misinformation out there. Climate, uh, the fossil fuel companies are, have done a lot of that misinformation. And that just leaves people confused. And when you're confused, you don't do anything about it. Um, so I'm trying to set the record straight by giving uh, presentations like this. So I've given over 100 of them in the last six years or so. so um, so yeah, let's get into this a little bit. And uh, if you have questions as we go along, feel free. Otherwise, at the end, I will try to save some time as well. Um, there has been an increase in the number of people that believe in human-caused climate change. It's, it's, it's gradually increased. This is called the Six Americas. This is back in 2014. And it breaks up the beliefs into these six different categories. Uh, if you were really alarmed about climate change, 13%, concerned, 31%, cautious, disengaged, doubtful, and dismissive. Um, not that encouraging. However, that has changed, and as of last year, the number of people in the U.S. It's, uh, that are alarmed has increased over 20%. And uh, so we've seen a, a, a more of an acceptance of human-caused climate change, and that it's something that we need to address and do something about. Still, we have the doubtfuls and dismissives. The dismissives are those that you can't talk to. They are 
stuck in their belief system. They're in an echo chamber, and they don't want to hear anything except what they want to hear. So I've learned not to try to argue with the dismissive. It doesn't work. But this is good news. We, we have seen an increase in the number of people that accept that human-caused climate change has happened. Uh, when you get away from politics and um, primarily politics and, and what scientists are actually saying about climate change, it can be summed up like this. It's simple, it's serious, and it's solvable. So that's what my presentation is broken up into, these three different areas. It is simple. There's no scientific community in the, in the community that I live in uh, that climate change is real, it's us, it's dangerous, scientists agree, and most importantly, we have solutions that are technically feasible, economically affordable, and politically viable. In regards to climate scientists agreeing that human-caused climate change is happening, 97% of actively published climate scientists agree that human-caused climate change is happening. I would suspect that that 3% is probably in the pockets of the fossil fuel industry. Now, uh, virtually 100% of the scientific research that's put out agrees, finds that human-caused climate change is happening. Peer-reviewed is the key here. It's peer-reviewed research. It has to be reviewed by your peers before you can publish it. There's a lot of research that is out there that's not peer-reviewed. Um, they've cherry-picked data, data to fit into their argument that climate change isn't happening and the like. So, when you Google on the internet climate change, you got to be really careful about what you're reading because it's easy to get into an area that um, argues otherwise. And they can look very convincing, very convincing. But these are the facts when it comes to agreeing about climate change. So, especially in politics, you hear this a lot. Well, climate's been changing forever. It will continue to change. It's just what, what, what happens uh, on, on this earth. And for the longest time, that was true, up until very recently. The, the reason that climate has changed over the centuries and over uh, even longer periods of time is because of changes in sunlight intensity. These changes in sunlight intensity are what have brought us in and out of ice ages repeatedly here. Um, and you know, the ice, uh, the glaciers reach about as far south as we are right here in Oregon. But the reasons for the changes of sunlight intensity are due to the wobbles in the Earth's uh, axis, changes in the tilt of the axis, and changes in the orbit of the Earth around the sun. So over hundreds of years, thousands of years, these subtle changes in sunlight intensity are what drove our climate to change. But that's not what's happening right now. As a matter of fact, climate scientists say that we should be in this gradual slide with the decrease in sunlight intensity to our next ice age, way out in the future. But we should actually be into a slightly cooling climate. And obviously that's not what's happening. So instead what's happening is we've changed the chemistry of our atmosphere. And that's what's causing the warming of the Earth to occur. 99% of our atmosphere is uh, oxygen and nitrogen, but we have these trace greenhouse gases. And they include water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. These all act as a, 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 a gas that traps heat uh, to close to the Earth's surface. It's kind of like a blanket. They, they, both, they all serve as a blanket to keep the heat in. If it wasn't for the greenhouse gases, we'd literally be living on an ice ball. Because the radiation from the sun itself is not enough to heat our, our Earth to a livable level. It's the greenhouse gases which have done that. Water vapor is a greenhouse gas, but the concentration hasn't changed. It's part of the water cycle. The amount of water that we've had on the Earth has been where it's been for a long time. Um, but these other three, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide, have seen an increase in their concentrations. And it's this concentration increase that has brought us to a warmer climate. So, the reason that we've seen an increase in the greenhouse gases is because of the burning of fossil fuels. Started with the start of the Industrial Revolution, about 1750 or so. And that has 
pump CO2 and the other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, that's caused the temperature rise, both in the atmosphere, on the Earth's surface, and in our oceans. They've all risen because of it. But then, again, the scientific community, you know, this is basic science, which has been understood for over 100 years. There's no dispute. You know, some at this point still try to dispute. Yeah, it's gone back over 100 years. Evidence that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. Joseph Fourier, back in the 1820s, recognized that there were greenhouse gases that kept our Earth warmer, that made our uh, world livable. That was more than just sunlight intensity that was uh, warming our Earth. Eunice Foote recognized that carbon dioxide, in particular, was a greenhouse gas. Savanti Arrhenius was able to pr project that um, a doubling of CO2 concentration would lead to a big increase in the atmospheric warmth of our, of, of our Earth. The guy, uh, Stuart Callender, did the same kind of work. But it's, so it goes way back to the 1800s, this basic understanding of uh, global warming and the fact that humans burning fossil fuels makes this happen. For climate scientists, it's important to put what's happening now in its proper perspective. So they've done this in a number of ways to figure out what's, what's the climate been in the past. They've done it through ice cores uh, drilling, uh, by looking at tree rings, coral shells analysis, the ocean floor sediment. They, these all have their um, are, are a way that you can look back in, in the past and figure it out. That's been a, especially these ice cores that have been very revealing. They've been able to drill down as much as two miles into the ice sheets of the Antarctic and in Greenland. And when you go down two miles, the ice you're extracting is as much as 800,000 years old. So climate scientists have a really good understanding about what our climate's done on a yearly basis for 800,000 years. Because in those ice cores are bubbles of ice, or bubbles of air. And that air is still the same air as when it was frozen. So the chemistry of the atmosphere is there, and you can tell. So again, 800,000 years of real exact history is uh, at their disposal. And this is one of the things that they were able to figure out, was the change in carbon dioxide concentration. This is parts per million change per 1,000 years, so it's a rate of change kind of thing. But you can see going back 800,000 years, the change in carbon dioxide concentration was bouncing back and forth in a narrow range. Uh, changes in sunlight intensity were the primary reason that this changed as well. Then you reach here. The very recent past, we've had this skyrocket of increase in the concentration of carbon dioxide. And um, yeah, uh, for uh, parts per million. So let's take a look at this narrow spike and spread this out a little bit. The Industrial Revolution got going in the mid-1700s, but we can accurately analyze the global average temperature, what it was going back to 1880. So that's why this starts there. And this is really when the Industrial Revolution was really getting going. And you can see what's happened. There's the increase in carbon dioxide concentration. It's increased about 50% since the start of the Industrial Revolution. 50% increase. And the global uh, average temperature is in blue. It's spiking up and down. Natural variation still is a contributing factor. But you can see how it's increased. Um, so the CO2 concentration, we, it's the highest that it's been in about 15 million years when uh, dinosaurs were walking the Earth. And the average global temperature has gone up, it's degrees Celsius over one degree now, about 1.2 degrees Celsius. Now I might say, well, 1.2 degrees Celsius, that's about 2.2 degrees Fahrenheit. What's the big deal? You know, today we've seen the temperature drop up and down uh, many degrees Fahrenheit. Well, keep in mind, the last time we had a ice age here, the average global temperature was six degrees cold, just six. So these one degree increments of change are a big deal. And it's just not CO2, it's methane. Methane uh, gas concentrations have gone up 
um, in, in, a lot, to say the least. Uh, and it's a big contributor as well of, our, of, of the warming of our Earth. Carbon dioxide, once it gets in the atmosphere, will stay up over a thousand years. That's one of the big problems with CO2, once it's up there. It's up there for a long, long time. Methane, it's a much powerful greenhouse gas, but it stays in the atmosphere for about 50 years, approximately, or so. So it's not up there as, as long, but it's just such a powerful greenhouse gas. And it's a major contributor right now as to what's happening. So we've seen an increase in our in the warmth of the atmosphere around the globe. Departure from the 1881 to 1910 average. So that's the baseline, and then how far above average do you go? You can see that we have below average years actually through the early 1900s. Last near average was back in about 1940. Ever since then, every year has been above average. And correspondingly more and more and more above average. And this is what alarms climate scientists. The rate of change in concentration of CO2, the rate of change of the warming that's taking place, this magnitude of change, is something that the Earth's never experienced. Never experienced like this. At least as far back as they can measure. The 10 hottest uh, years globally have all been uh, since 2010, and actually every year since 2013 has been uh, in that top 10 of hottest years ever. 2021 is here, not the hottest ever, that was 2016, but still natural variations in our atmosphere contribute to that average global temperature. There's El Nino, La Nina, which are uh, changes in the equatorial Pacific temperature, which play a big part. We have a La Nina winter coming up um, here, which uh, plays a part in what we expect. So this warming has had serious implications. So let's take a look at that. So we've seen rising seas happen. We've seen increases in wild weather and extreme weather events. Rising seas are occurring because of the melting of land ice and also because of the thermal expansion of the, of the ocean as it warms, it, it expands. We've seen an increase in the frequency and severity of wild weather events or extreme weather events. Because when you warm the atmosphere like we have, you're, you've supercharged the atmosphere. That supercharging manifests itself as these extreme events. We've seen Arctic sea ice uh, steadily melt away. Fifth year ice is the old ice, the dense ice. It's hard to melt it, um, but you can see how it's decreased just since 1985. First year ice, which is much less dense, easily melts and the like, has a decrease here as well. It's just not the polar bears that are suffering though. You've seen the pictures of them swimming in the ocean with no ice around them. It's been humans that have been impacted, United States citizens that have been impacted. This is Shishmarif. It's a, a village of indigenous people in Alaska right along the western coast, a narrow spit of land that they've, they've lived on. There's a number of villages here. Uh, Shishmarif in particular is right there. There's a number of them. This has been considered the most, the area most impacted by climate change to date is where they live. This is Shishmarif. The land that used to make up this village has shrunk around them um, because of a number of things that are going on. But it's primarily due to the melting of uh, permafrost, which is what everything is up here. So the, the land's literally melting underneath their buildings. But the biggest thing has been battery waves because the sea ice is no longer gets close to their coastline. You get these intense winter storms come through, these huge waves form um, because there's so much more open water now. And it, it batters these coastlines. You see they've tried to um, mitigate that a little bit by putting stone out there. This, that's the ocean side to the left. But it's only been partially successful. So the village of 600 voted to relocate in, way back in 2016 now. And the cost of uh, resettling? About $180 million. 
for this village of 600. But you think about it, you're taking the whole village, moving it, infrastructure, uh, buildings, sewer systems, streets. That's what it costs for a village of 600. If it costs that much for a village of 600, what kind of costs are we going to be looking at in the future as ocean levels continue to rise? The majority of the population is along coastlines. And ocean levels have been rising and will continue to rise. Um, so this is going through the end of the century. That's change in sea level in feet. And this is business as usual if we continue to burn fossil fuels at the rate we are right now. We can have as much as an eight foot rise in sea levels. The more we limit the use of fossil fuels and transition over to renewables, we flatten this curve and, and keep that level less and less. But this is the path we're on right now unless we make changes. So you think about it, as sea levels rise, the kind of migration you're going to have to have away from those coastlines and the costs that would be involved. Astronomical. Do we want to pay those costs now? The costs of, of uh, transitioning over to renewables faster than we are right now? Or do we want to pay these costs? To me, it's a no-brainer. Bite the bullet now. Take your medicine because you can't, you can't let this happen. But it's just not the oceans, it's just not coastlines. It's well inland here that we're experiencing the effects of a warming climate. Temperature change in degrees Fahrenheit just since 1970. Um, the world has seen it increase about 2.2 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the transition from Celsius that I gave you before. The United States is uh, warmer than average, 2.6, Wisconsin 2.8. Madison, Oregon, 3.1. So we're seeing our climate warm much faster than the worldwide average. Why is that? Because of the influence of the Arctic. Um, we're relatively close to it, and the Arctic is by far the fastest warming part of our world. But we're, we're feeling that effects. And the thing is, the warming is not broken up evenly between the seasons. It's winter that is warming much faster than uh, spring uh, summer and fall. They're all warming, but especially winters where we're feeling this effect. Primarily because of again, the Arctic. These Arctic outbreaks that we've seen for generations, for thousands of years, they're essentially not as cold as they used to be. They're not as frequent because the Arctic itself is warm. So we're seeing this shift in our seasons. Our summers are getting longer, our winters are getting shorter. For Madison and Oregon, the average wintertime seasonal temperature has increased almost 5 degrees Fahrenheit just in the last 51 years. That's a blink of time climatically. And we've seen this kind of climate. Um, year to year, it bounces all over the place due to natural uh, variation playing its part. But that's what the trend line is. And this is why it's kind of hard to use your memory to analyze what's going on because there is a lot of change seasonally. But when you look at it this way, this is what it is. Close to five degrees Fahrenheit. We have on average about two more weeks of above normal winter days than we did 50 years ago. These are big changes, right? And I'm sure you can kind of relate. What was it like in your youth? What were winters like then compared to winters like now? We're noticing it big time. Less extreme cold. Coldest day each winter used to be about 21 degrees below zero for Madison and Oregon. Now it's more about 13 degrees below zero. It's warmed about nine degrees Fahrenheit. And I might say, well, what's the problem there, Bob? Our heating bills aren't as bad anymore. It's not as cold at night. Granted, but the positives are more than outweighed by negatives. More insects carrying disease survive. Uh, we're, it's just not as, as cold enough during the winter to kill off a, a lot of the insects that normally would. We're getting these invasive insects spreading north that uh, can tolerate our warmer winters. We're seeing uh, fruit trees blossom too early, that it starts pollen production earlier. We have less snow on average across Wisconsin. So, snow is a big wintertime recreation 
financial source for the state. You know, people come here to cross-country ski, snowmobile, ice fish, and the like. Not as much snow to do that anymore. So that's had a substantial impact. And that carries into spring. Oops. Got a little too far ahead of myself. Let's go back in the other direction. So, we're seeing these early spring impacts from our warmer winters carrying into our spring. Um, and I'm sure you recall this, we've had some very warm springs and everything starts to sprout early. Plants start getting going, but then we still can get a killing freeze pretty easily. And so, that's caused a lot of crop damage. Uh, we've lost vineyards, we've lost apple orchards to the tune of millions of dollars just in the last decade. Um, there's a, a dance that's always played out every year between um, evolution and climate. Um, and when they change, then you get a mistiming that takes place. And so insect pollination's been mistimed, uh, birds' food uh, supply has been disrupted. They're not matching up anymore. And again, we're getting uh, allergies going earlier because uh, plants are starting to sprout earlier. Um, so yeah, we have these serious implications that are happening, um, and they met up. And they, they're basically into three different categories: the serious impacts, nature, health, and economy. Let's talk about economy first. One way to measure um, the economic impact of extreme weather events is the number of billion dollar events that have occurred. It's kind of a metric you can use to measure. And the frequency between billion dollar disasters back in the 1980s used to be oh, 80 to 100 days between these extreme <coughs> weather events. Look where we're at now. The number, the, the frequency has really increased. But it's just not the frequency, it's the intensity of the systems that have become much more uh, uh, impactful as well. Again, we've supercharged our atmosphere. Climate scientists decades ago forecast this, so it's coming true. So this was last year, the billion dollar disasters that happened across the United States. And they run the gamut of drought, flooding, hail, hurricanes, tornadoes, severe weather, wildfire, winter storms. These are all at minimum billion dollar disasters that occurred. Climate change didn't solely cause any of these disasters, but they were a contributing factor. Okay, they had the fingerprints on all of these, whether it be a winter storm or heat or, um, or any of these. It had, they, it's had its impact. This is just uh, this year so far. And of course, we had Ian, second most uh, costly hurricane in history behind Katrina. And not to mention deaths and injuries. So, I mean, we've been lucky here in Wisconsin for the most part. We had a major hailstorm take place this spring, not that far away in Iowa. Um, but uh, we've been fortunate the last few years in Wisconsin that we have not seen a billion dollar event. But we've seen ours. And again, it's just not the United States. This is September, just the month of September across the world. And I'm sure you've seen headlines. Um, all the uh, flooding that occurred in Europe early this year, and then they've had extreme heat and drought. Um, and all, all, every continent of the earth has, has seen an impact. I could make this talk two hours easily by looking at all parts of the world. And there has been a big health impact by, from climate change. Due to shifting rainfall, warming temperatures, wildfires, you're, you get floods and droughts, violent storms, extreme heats, fire and smoke, and you get these health impacts, including injury and death mental illness, heat stress, insect sports of these diseases, and lung disease and allergies, which is a big one, um, as well uh, as, as health impacts. 
Um, here locally, probably the biggest uh, impact in terms of economic damage has been due to flooding. <coughs> And I'm sure you recall 2018, 2019. We had back-to-back -back years, right? Um, yeah, it was it was bad. And again, scientists say this is what you can expect. Uh, for every one degree increase in the atmospheric temperature, you get four percent more water vapor in the atmosphere due to evaporation of uh, of uh, water into, into the atmosphere. And the warmer the atmosphere, the more water it can hold. Anyway, we've gone up over a little over three degrees just in 50 years. So we have 12 percent more water vapor up there in the last 50 years for storms to um, tap into. And so the one top one percent of extreme rainfall events, which are the catastrophic rainfall events, uh, have increased about 42 percent in the upper Midwest region, and that's from 1958 to 2016, which is the latest analysis I can find. But that's probably the number one serious impact that we have here in terms of economic damage as well, uh, catastrophic flooding. Now there's other th impacts of, of our warming climate that you might not think about. Algae blooms. Um, of course, we get these more frequent heavy rainfall events, which wash those unwanted nutrients into the lakes. And then the lakes themselves are getting warmer. Put that all together, and algae is, uh, grows much more readily, including uh, toxic algae, and, and we see that more and more. Poison ivy, you might not think about this. Poison ivy l likes this warmer climate we're in. The toxicity of, of poison ivy has increased well over a double from 1950 to today. Business as usual, if we continue on the path we're on right now, it'll almost double in a relatively short uh, time span about 40, 50 years. I, I uh, got poison ivy twice this summer. Once taking my dog to the dog park and reaching into the weeds for a ball. And another time in my backyard, I was cleaning out some weeds and wasn't careful. That poison ivy took a long time to resolve. You know, it just doesn't, not only was it very uncomfortable, but man, it was tough to get rid of. So I, I know firsthand this one. Ticks, ticks like a warmer climate. So we're seeing, we've seen a big increase in the number of Lyme disease cases in Wisconsin. Lyme disease is incurable, it's bad, you don't want it, but uh, this is another byproduct of our warming climate, is more ticks. Mosquitoes, the number of mosquito days has increased about 10. You have about 10 more days on average since the 1980s. This is more than just the inconvenience of slapping up Mosquito, uh, when you're in the garden, it's also those uh, disease-carrying mosquitoes, including uh, Nile and, and Zika, West Nile and Zika. Uh, mosquitoes are more prevalent now. And allergies, which is a big one. We're seeing um, more asthma hospitalizations. We're seeing a longer and more severe allergy season. And that's because it's not only warmer, but our, our growing season has really increased. Since, again, the last 50 years, our growing season has increased a full month. Now, for farmers, is that a good thing? You could say yes. Um, there are other things that are negative, but that's one positive. But we have this longer season for all the allergy-producing plants to grow and, um, and bother us and put uh, young and, and firm uh, elderly in the hospitals. So that's a big one. And it's projected to grow. Again, business as usual, if we don't change the trajectory we're on, grass pollen production is an example of one of the, dip, one of the pollens. There we are in 2020, could very well double, um, if not more, just by 2008. So again, that's changes that will continue to happen um, as we go um, more into the center, unless we make changes in the path we're on. As I mentioned before, this, these one degree increments of change Celsius are a big deal. The, the plan is, the idea by uh, the Paris Accord, this agreement from, of all the countries, was to try to reduce 
fossil fuel emissions to a point where we uh, level off and keep that global temperature at 1.5 degrees C. We're at about 1.2 right now, so it's only three tenths of a degree is what the goal has been. We're not going to make it. We're going to go over 1.5. But we definitely do not want to go to 2 degrees C. We want to keep it underneath that because these are the impacts of this additional warming in terms of sea level rise, ecosystems, extreme weather, Arctic and ice. You see millions of people exposed to severe droughts, so many more. Um, and these impacts, 10.4 million people have to, are exposed to sea level rise, 410 million of, of, of severe drought by two, by, if it hits 2 degrees C. That means migrations happen. And all the social disruptions that are caused by that. It's like a domino effect, you know. So this is really bad. We don't want to go there. We have to keep it under 2 degrees C. And as close to 1.5 as possible. It's doable. The question is, do we have the political will to make it happen? We're closing in on 1.5, and we're probably going to reach it by mid-century, probably by about 2050, is where, when we'll be there. So where do we go past mid-century to the end of the century? It all depends upon us and what we do in terms of reducing the burning of fossil fuels, getting over to renewables. Um, no emission cuts. If we, we continue on the uh, path we've been on, this is where we end up, about 4 degrees C warmer. It could be even worse um, by the end of the century. If we can really mitigate and cut down uh, the use of fossil fuels, we can keep ourselves under 2 degrees C. So it's up, up upon us, upon us to, you know, what we're going to do. Part of our problem is, you know, the political system is set up just to look at the short range, the next couple of years. You know, you want to keep your constituents happy, so your politicians are focused in on that. It's really hard, and human nature, I think, is the same, to look out that far in the future of impacts. You know, we're so inflation's out of control. I mean, you know, we have enough problems right now, right? It's hard to think that far in the future. But for our kids and grandkids, we've got to. Uh, and again, locally, we warm faster than the world on average. So significant cuts, if we flatten out the curve, puts uh, Wisconsin at about 2 degrees C. We're going we're, we're to reach that. Um, but continued emissions puts us in the 5.5 to 6 degrees C warm. Okay. Six degrees colder Celsius, we had an ice age. We could be six degrees warmer here, okay? And you can just think about everything that's happening. To put this in perspective, um, Madison, if we are business as usual, gives us a summer about 11.5 degrees Fahrenheit hotter by the end of the century, giving us the summertime uh, climate of Alexandria, Louisiana. I don't know about you, but there's a reason I live up here and not down there, right? And, but it's just not the fact it's going to be hotter. It's everything that comes with that heat, right? Um, what kind of vegetation will we grow? What can we plant? It's not going to be what we plant now. It's not what we grow in our gardens now. It'll all be a lot different. Um, so can't let this happen. We can't go there. But it's solvable. There are, all the solutions are in place now, but we have to make it, we got to make it happen. Part of the complication when it comes to solving is that greenhouse gas emissions are spread out through the entire, uh, all these different sectors. Transportation, electricity, and industry are about equal, 25%. We have agriculture, commercial, and residential are, so, are also contributing. Uh, factors. You've got to address all of these if you're going to flatten that curve fast enough, which makes it a chance to the challenge. But one thing we can do is just reduce our carbon footprint, right? Reduce our electrical consumption um, helps a lot. Uh, building better buildings are part of that. Using a better uh, glass for insulation, insulation itself. 
getting away from uh, uh, gas heating and go, going to all electrical heating and cooling. So there's the buildings that can be improved upon. Your house um, can be improved upon fairly easily. Probably have done a number of these. When it comes time to replace a furnace, look at a high efficiency heat pump. It makes a big difference. Insulation in the attic makes a big difference. Energy smart appliances, when it's time to replace that appliance, make sure it's as energy efficient as possible. Smart thermostats are a big one too. And LED light, as we've been doing for a number of years. But you can save quite a bit, close to $600 per year utility costs on average for Wisconsin. And you can reduce your emissions by about, about three uh, tons of, of CO2. That's a lot of CO2, just that you can do individually. We have to electrify transportation. Again, it's about a quarter of the, of the emissions. That transition is happening, as you know, and auto companies are pretty aggressive in terms of going over to all electric uh, by 2030 for a lot of them. Um, but we have a long ways to go. Just a small percentage of our current, all the vehicles out there are electric. It's going to take a while to get them all off the roads, right? But this has to be addressed. For agriculture, um, there's a number of things that farmers can do, including uh, growing uh, uh, cover crops, applying compost, doing a reduced tilling practices. Um, I know, you know, farmers are always living on the edge, economically, so they have to be uh, addressed very carefully when it comes to uh, climate change. But this is something that they can do pretty easily. Another big one that you can do is just simply what you eat, because animal-based foods are much more resource-intensive than plant-based foods. So blue is fresh water consumption, green is land use, orange is greenhouse gas emissions. There's beef and, and, and the different meats. Uh, but I'll tell you, poultry is a lot less intensive than beef. <coughs> Eat as much chicken as you can, right? Try to stay away from that steak on the grill. I should talk. I still throw one on once in a while. Can't help myself. Habits are hard to break. But I have a vegetarian daughter who's been working on me. Uh, but if, you veg if you're vegetarian, you can really make an impact um, in terms of where our world goes. All kinds of things that you can think about. If you and I eat a lot of more vegetarian meals than I used to once I found this out. Um, the Earth's always had these carbon sinks. They've naturally drawn out CO2. Um, every year this happens uh, through grasslands, coastal wetlands, peatlands, and forests. Unfortunately, we're losing them. We should be expanding them. So this is an area that needs addressing to expand all these different uh, carbon sinks. Throwing a lot at you, but just want to give you an idea. And the big one is just, again, emissions. Getting away from um, fossil fuel uh, consumption and going to renewables. You know, fossil fuels, for as much as I bash them, I mean, they're the reason we have our standard of living that we have right now, right? It is because of uh, the, everybody has electricity now. Relatively cheap electricity, especially compared to other parts of the world. But their time has come, and they have to go. And we're, at, we're more than past that point that we have to uh, phase them out. Renewable energy takes on a number of forms. There's nuclear, controversial, justifiably so. Um, but I think it, we have to, this is me talking personally, um, we have to research it. We have to see if it's viable and can be part of this stool, this three-pronged stool of uh, renewable energy. There's also um, uh, through, through, uh, water, the damming of water um, is a way. Um, there's uh, thermal in the names right now. Uh, the big ones though, <laughs> let's get to those. I forget those other two at the moment. But um, 
are solar and wind. Those are the big ones. Well, hydroelectric is, uh, is the one I was thinking about. I'll think about the other one too. But these are the major ones. That, they've come down in costs uh, by magnitudes just in the last decade. They're so much more affordable now. And solar, well, yes, it's the solar is most effective in the southwest. It's still very effective here and cost, uh, and, and you can make it work. It's, it's viably cost effective. And you can see what's happened in our village, which is great um, in terms of, especially in schools that have uh, used solar. Um, it is viable. I have solar at our church at St. John's. I have solar on my roof. It works, and it, it pays itself off in a relatively short period. And the thing is, right now, the majority of our um, production of electricity is through coal burning. Where's that coal coming from? From Wyoming. Where's all of our money going out there to pay for all this coal? Why not keep it here, keep the jobs here? And solar jobs by just 2050, an increase in nine jobs per 10,000 people. Uh, wind is again viable uh, in Wisconsin. It's again, it's most effective here, but still cost effective to do in Wisconsin as well. And again, keep the jobs here. Keep your uh, energy production local. And uh, it's projected by, yeah, by 2050, potential job changes uh, would be 23 jobs for 10,000 people. But anyway, you kind of get the idea there that it's just not reducing our carbon footprint. It's economic benefits of doing this. Um, there was the Inflationary Reduction Act, IRA, passed earlier this uh, summer by, the, by Congress and the Biden administration. Uh, IRA, I think, is not a very good name for it. But it is, it's, it's a big deal. It's a big deal for us for taking a step in the right direction in terms of flattening that curve that I was talking about. IRA contains $369 billion to boost, uh, to boost clean energy and cut emissions. The law is expected to have a greater impact on U.S. climate goals than any previous policy. Um, it's, a, it's, it's projected to be a job producer, just a, as I was talking about for Wisconsin. 1.7 million energy uh, supply jobs would be produced just by 2030. Um, so again, job producer. And what can't be underestimated is just pollution in general. Pollution from those coal fire plants. Pollution from all the automobiles that are, uh, that are generating uh, carbon monoxide and the other particular matters. By 2035, IRA could avoid an estimated 63,000 premature deaths by reducing pollution. And I would pose to you just that and alone makes it worthwhile doing uh, the health benefits of it. So that's a nice step, but it's not enough. It does not flatten the curve enough. Um, you know, we, we're seeing just because of the cost difference between renewables and coal and oil, uh, the renewables are that much cheaper, so all of our new production that's being built almost all of it now is uh, solar and wind. There's, you don't see coal fire plants being built. You do see natural gas plants being built. They, they say that's a bridge fuel. It's, it's uh, methane, okay? It's still a bad gas. There's so much leakage that occurs um, that you still don't want to use that. Um, but we have this transitioning happening. Market forces are doing their thing, going to the less less uh, to the cheaper source, but it's not happening fast enough. Um, again, the Biden um, IRA will reduce the different sectors by this much. Transportation and power are the ones that will be reduced the most. But are these even 50 percent? Are they 75 percent? No. You know, if we have to get to 100 percent. Um, in a relatively short period of time. Uh, Biden's goal is to reduce 
um, greenhouse gas emissions by 50% by the end of this decade. Right? This IRA won't get us quite there, but it, it, does, it does its thing. So it's a nice initial step, but we have to have more steps, unfortunately. I wish I could say this was it, but that's not the case. And when I was starting to do these talks like six years ago, I was looking at solutions. One thing that popped out to me right away, and again, I'm not an economist, but what economists were saying overwhelmingly is if you put a price on carbon, that's the most effective way to reduce carbon emissions. Right now we have all this economic cost I was telling you about, these billions of dollars in expenditures every year. How do we pay for those costs right now? Through our taxes, through insurance rates. For some, they just lose their, their homes, right? Especially in Florida, that's happening. Um, but if you can put a price on carbon, then you put the true cost of that source in perspective. Coal and oil, they've calculated it out per ton, you, there's this much economic cost, damage cost, that should be into that uh, fuel when you, when you figure out the cost. If you do that, their costs become much higher than they are right now. Compared to renewables, you have this huge cost separation. And then you see the market forces do their thing, and you see this transition to the renewables happen at the rate that we need it to happen. But it's not easy to do this. It's not easy to say, because you hear the word like tax, you know, it's like, no, no tax, can't have any tax. Um, but the carbon price is the single most powerful tool available to reduce Americans' carbon, uh, produce, to reduce Americans' carbon pollution. There's a number of legislations in in Congress right now that address this. The one that I'm most excited about is called the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act because it does put this uh, fee on the fuel source, but what it does is it, you take the fee and you pay it back to us as a dividend. Because if you increase the costs of, uh, of uh, those fuels, everything goes up in costs, right? Substantially. But if you have that money in your pocket to address that, then you know that those impacts are mitigated. So that's the, the big thing is putting it back in your pocket. So you can get to net zero by 2050. You have affordable clean energy. You save lives. You put money in your pocket. It's all there for the taking if we have the political will to do it. Unfortunately, we don't have the political will right now. Um, we were hoping we in some like-minded folks were hoping that a carbon price could be put into this legislation, this IRA. Uh, but there's one uh, particular senator that held things up and it didn't happen. But still have hope that it eventually will get passed. You get this net zero by 2050, you're 30% less in emissions just in the next five years. That's how impactful this change would be. Um, because right now, this is the uh, arc we're on. This is as usual to 2050. At least this was the case before IRA. This will start dropping down. Um, Energy Innovation Carbon Dividend Act, though, by 2050, it virtually does it all. 90% reduction in greenhouse gases for the United States by 2050. So. Between that and IRA, we get there. We, we flatten the curve. It's all there for us. Can you name that senator? Please. <laughs> Manchin. Okay. Senator Manchin. That's exactly who I thought it was. Yeah, it is. Um, but um, yeah, so we get there. Uh, the IPCC, the, uh, what, what the world is trying to do through the Paris Accord, is keep things under 1.5. And again, this act almost does it by itself, but it keeps us well under two degrees. So, that's where we're at. And again, as I mentioned before, a healthier environment, 350,000 lives are lost each year due to air pollution. 4.5 million lives saved in the next 50 years just thanks to clean air. And again, families get paid. This is a big part of it. 
Uh, it's projected that a family of four by year 10 would get an annual check of close to $3,000. And the thing is, for those lower income families, those that have a small carbon footprint, they're not going to need to use all that money to pay for their increase in, uh, in costs. That extra money goes in the economy and you make it's an economy growth uh, thing as well. Make the economy grow. It's all good. So there's a um, volunteer organization, nonprofit, called Citizens Climate Lobby. I'm part of it. I've been part of Citizens Climate Lobby for about five years now, but they're laser focused in trying to get this carbon uh, fee um, implemented. Every year we meet, at least we did before COVID, um, and what we do is split up into groups and visit every uh, member of Congress and a member of Senate and uh, personally lobby them. And I, was, I had the privilege of doing that for a couple of years. It's really cool. I mean, it's talk about our democracy at work, being able to talk directly to a senator or to their top eight at least and, you know, <coughs> tell them your beliefs. So this climate lobby, if you're thinking, well, what organization can I join? This is one to consider. There's a, a Madison uh, uh, chapter. One last thing I want to address is climate restoration. You can still, eat, there's these efforts underway to use technology to draw out carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. These technologies are exciting. Still in their infancy, though. But there, there's a lot of them, actually. The goal is to reduce the level of carbon dioxide and methane in the atmosphere to pre-industrial levels using a wide array of technologies now in development. That's an ambitious goal, to bring it all out. But if it can do at least part of the job, that can help us get to that goal because of the lack of political will that is unfortunately part of our reality. But uh, there's direct air capture of, uh, that draws CO2 directly out of the atmosphere. You can pull it out. There's a, uh, you can convert landfill methane into renewable natural gas. Pretty cool idea. Because methane, because landfills are a major source of methane emissions. And the thing is, it's being done right now. Right here in Dane County. Dane County, I think, is the most progressive county in the entire country when it comes to reducing carbon footprint um, and being at the forefront of, um, of uh, reducing the use of, of fossil fuels. Yeah, the, you go out there, there's this facility. They developed it. They didn't have the help of the state. They didn't have the help of the, of the federal government. They did it all on their own. They developed it and they put it into effect. Um, there's biodigesters with the greenhouse, with uh, methane gas that they also bring into this uh, thing. And so all the, uh, the fleet of Dane County vehicles is, 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 uh, has a fuel of renewable natural gas. And I think uh, Quick Trip also uses them as well, uh, uses, the, uses RNG. So that's one that's, matter of fact, a lot of counties come here to see what we've done and are trying to duplicate that. Uh, convert garbage into sustainable aviation fuel. That's being done. It's just a matter of making it scalable enough and affordable enough to make it uh, happen. And that's kind of a common theme, making it scalable enough and affordable enough to implement. Uh, there's regenerative agriculture. There's uh, ocean atmospheric methane removal that's going on. I'm not going to get into these in detail unless you want to ask a question. Kelp forests in the ocean to draw out CO2. Carbon mineralization. Um, this is, so these are all different technologies. So they're all not going to probably work, but it's, I think it's just incredibly important to really invest major dollars into these. See which ones are really fly, and use those to help us with this problem that we have. So, oh, what's it going to do? Oh, it's going to show a picture. That's of uh, direct air capture. But it's not nearly scalable enough and affordable enough. But the technology's there. They just have to continue to research and refine it. So 
you know, we've done big things before. The United States has led the world in technology all the time. I think we should be the ones to lead the world again in, uh, in, in technologies and this effort to uh, make this transition happen. The world usually leads, follows us, right? We're by far the biggest economic engine in the entire world. What we do matters a lot to the rest of the world. So, you know, we should be leading the world as well. In terms of what you can do, two of the big things I think are what I have here. Just have conversations with your family, friends, and neighbors about climate change. It's kind of the elephant in the room. But everybody has their busy lives. Probably your sons and daughters, you know, they're busy just trying to get by. But talk to them about it. <laughs> Bring it out in the open. Have discussions. Uh, because it's the younger generation. You can see the age group we have here, right? And I see this over and over. It's getting the younger folks more engaged. That's a challenge. So do your part in trying to engage them. Uh, sum it up. Simple, well-understood science that goes back to the 1800s. It is serious. Impacts are already being felt and will only accelerate. But it's solvable. We do have what we need to make the changes happen. This is why I'm here. These are my three grandkids, right? Um, this is why I've given over 100 of these talks. I don't want the world to go in the direction it's happening. You know, I think we all have to find our part to do what we can. This is what, what I've found is my part, is to do talks like this. But I challenge you to find what you can do to help your kids and grandkids, you know? Put, the, put your pictures of your kids and grandkids or maybe even great grandkids uh, in that picture. Because they're the ones that are going to feel it after we were, you know, long gone. But they don't have the power we do. It's up to us. And it's not only our kids and grandkids, you know, it's it's just the youth of the world. So that's my email. If you have follow up questions with me, if you want the slide presentation, if you want it, give it. I'll give it to you. No problem. Feel free. Um, but there's my email and phone number. You can feel free to contact me. So I'm sure I went over yeah, a solid hour, and that's what I usually do. Thank you for staying with me. I know I threw a ton of stuff at you, um, but I really pared it down as best I can um, in terms of giving the message. Uh, do you have any questions for, uh, for everything that I've thrown at you? You know, I, this might not be on the same thing, but what do you consider our climate situation for this winter? Our climate situation for this winter? Because of La Nina, which means the equatorial Pacific is expected to be colder than average, we're supposed to have a slightly colder and snowier winter than normal. So again, the local natural processes still are the primary driver. So you have to think about, is it supposed to be warmer than average? Well, this one might be one that we see the spikes, might be more of a, a, a colder spike. You know, but when you take a look at the long-term average, and even though we're a little, maybe a little colder and snowier, if that projection works out, other parts of the world will be the opposite. And you're still going to have the whole world in average being top 10 winter easily. But we, uh, but we could have the, the exception of winter. And, and um, uh, getting rid of office bills and going to the market. I've uh, got their problem to work on, I see that. But in order for the uh, public to want to go that way more, they're going to have to bring down the cost of these vehicles mm -hmm. so it's reasonable. Yeah. Because forty, fifty thousand dollars, nobody can. Yeah, yeah. That's 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 one of the challenges for EVs is making them more affordable, making them around twenty grand. You know, for what an economy car can still be, well, could be purchased before. Uh, you know, this last year or so. Uh, but like personally, I, I have a, a Leaf, one that's two years old, 5,000 miles. I got it for about $24,000. But that was before everything ramped up big. I don't know, do you have any idea, do they make the Prius yet? The Prius, they still do. And again, hybrids are still much better than, uh, you know, regular gas. So if you, if, and there's a lot of hybrids on the market. You know, if you're in the market for a new car. Uh, personally, we have this Leaf, 
but its range is about 150 miles. It's not a long range version. But uh, we have a hybrid, too, as our second vehicle when we need to drive longer distances. Unfortunately, that's the reality we're in, right? We don't have enough charging stations yet. Uh, unless you have a long range EV, which can work, but uh, they're expensive, the long range EVs. They're talking about putting those charging stations in all across the United States. They are. And that's part of the IRA, is putting in many more of these charging stations. So in the next few years, you'll see many more pop up around the area. What, what happens after you get all these electric cars? and these batteries go back. What happens to this pile of batteries that are used? My understanding is you can recycle them. Yeah, you, can. Mm. you can recycle them. Mm -hmm. Yes? Aren't the batteries so really expensive to replace? I mean, I've been reading. Yeah, they're expensive. They're by far the most expensive component of an electric vehicle is the battery. But they have come, come down a lot in cost uh, just in the last couple of years. You know, there's a lot of money being poured into battery technology making them more affordable and more efficient. So I think we're going to continue to see that, uh, where they become more affordable, which will be the big driver of making the EV more affordable, right? Is making that battery um, more affordable as well. well and, and aren't they also saying that repair costs on an electric car are much more reasonable than a, a regular car because there's not as many moving parts? Yeah, you know, the maintenance is nothing. I mean, I, we've had this leaf for about a year. I haven't had it in. It's like, rotate the tires. That's all I have to do. You know, it's, it's incredible. So, yeah, the change, the reduction in maintenance costs, fuel costs. Um, you know, you should factor that into your cost right. calculation, right, of how much that EV costs. Because, I'll, I'll tell you, it's just a basic leaf. I mean, but I, we love it. It's, it's, a, it's a fun vehicle. Wow. Who makes it? Who makes it? It's a Nissan. Nissan is, uh, is the leaf. Um, that, uh, yeah. They're also very quiet. They're all quiet. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you gotta have to have make have to have make noise. Yeah. Especially when they back up. And they do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They, they have to make. My daughter noise. said, "What's that sound?" You know, I said, "Oh, I don't know. It's just someone does that." How many have you? Uh, yeah. She looked it up. <laughs> do any of you have any right now? I know. I'm just asking. How many? If any, do you have, you have a hybrid? Um, yeah, they're, they're, they're all good, good steps in the right direction. But, you know, yeah, you got to be able to afford it. It has to be when you're ready to get that. But really, when it comes time to get your next vehicle, really look hard at it. So if it's two years from now, it's going to be a different, they're going to be much more cheaper relative to a gas pump car than they are right now. And I wonder, is there any statistics on how many times a battery goes bad in those cars? I'm not aware yeah, of that. I'm sure not. there are. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I think it's negligible. I think. I mean, when I got our EV, it was not, I didn't worry about that. What about charging stations in your home? Yeah. You know, do you, get it are they more expensive? Are they expensive to install? You know, like, I, I can just tell you my own experience. Uh, we got a charging station, a, a quick charger. Mm -hmm. um, we actually have it integrated into our solar system. Uh -huh. So we are... We're basically off the grid with our, our car. Okay. It's coming from solar and, and, and charging that car. Um, but it's that there are, are grants out there. I know for Alliant, we got a, we got that charger itself paid for, 100% paid for. We still have, have the labor of having to put right. in. But you know, there's all kinds of grants out there that you're going to see more and more, especially with IRA now. Um, you're going to see these coming down the pipeline. And it's including electric vehicles and making them uh, more affordable. So always keep that in mind as you go forward. Do you know if there's any research, and I've been thinking about this, is by using the sun sensor key, I have a solar cells on your vehicle and an electric vehicle. In order to well, you sun having solar energy, panels you on, your, uh, on your electric car? Mm -hmm. That's being done uh, uh, in, in research. But it's just not anywhere close to being economically a viable thing yet. But they're going to get in that direction. I think it's just a matter of time before, yeah, a, a lot of your electric generation will come from a solar that's on the top of your car. It'll come with time. It's just a matter of when. Any other questions? 
All right. Well, thank you for staying with me and on this pleasant uh, fall afternoon. Um, enjoy the rest of the afternoon. I think I'm going to get out of the golf course for a little bit while it's still nice and warm. Enjoy it. But uh, thanks for attending. I appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you. Is that a new Hall out there? It is.